Welcome, people, to the, this edition of Beers with Bill. It's my great pleasure to, to welcome Matt McDonald, Barn Cat Artisan Ales. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So can you talk to me a little bit about Barncat as a brewery? Yeah, sure. So um, we got started, uh, we've been open over six years. Uh, April was our sixth anniversary. Um, we were two home brewers uh, brewing in our garages and backyards. And we decided to make a run of turning that home brewery into a pro brewery. Uh, we business planned it. We didn't see anything stopping us from doing it. So we went ahead and did it. Uh, when we opened, we were Cambridge's second brewery. The only other brewery in town at the time was Grand River. And since then, we've seen Grand River come and go. And uh, now there's nine breweries in Cambridge. And all these new ones popping up. So we've really seen, in our six years, a lot of growth within the industry. Um, we're still a two-person company. It's just me and my partner, Jeremy, that do everything. Uh, from brewing to bookkeeping, everything that you need to do to run a brewery is done with only the two of us. Okay. So we're going to start with your Pilsner today. Yeah, sure. Here's my can of the Pilsner. Cheers. Cheers. Talk to me a little bit about it. Do you do anything special to the water to brew this Pilsner? Uh, no, our, our water, we typically just treat the same for each beer that we make. We don't really play around with the water uh, dependent on the style of beer that we're making. Uh, the big thing for us is because we're on city water, we have to get the chlorine out of it. Uh, and other than that, our water's really hard, so we have to add acid to soften it. Other than that, it's pretty standard water profile that we use across all of the different styles of beers we make. Um, this particular beer uh, we brew in the style of German Pilsner. Um, we have done Czech Pilsners as well. Um, German Pilsners tend to be my preference. They're a little leaner, uh, a little crisper, a little bit more bitter, um, really beers that you can drink a lot in large quantity um, and really, really good with food. So definitely this is, of all the Pilsners that we make, this one, this was the first one that we ever did, uh, which is why it's just called Pilsner. And uh, it's definitely my favorite of the ones we've done. You've answered all my questions on that. I was going to ask your preference. You say you like this particular style. Yeah. And yeah. All, those, all those valid reasons for why you would drink a German Pilsner. And Is I it, love Czech Pilsner too. Um, I like I I really do enjoy them. Uh, from like my preference is probably German, and then we've seen both of them do fairly well. But uh, from a yeast management perspective, it's easier to just roll with uh, German inspired lagers than bounce back and forth between Czech and German, and balancing two lager yeasts. When did you, or how did you know it was time to start Barncat? Uh, there wasn't really like anything, I want any solid indicator. It was me and Jeremy met, we had met because we had both won uh, gold medals in the Ontario, or in the Canadian Mulbring uh, Awards. Um, and then just from our profiles on Bar Towel, which was a beer related forum back in the day it still exists nobody's really on it anymore but um just from that uh i kind of recognized that we were geographically close to each other so i just asked him if he wanted to meet up to trade homebrews like i want a medal you want a medal let's trade these homebrews and then after getting to know him just by trading homebrews uh starting a brewery something that i had always been thinking of doing i knew that he had something like it's something that he wanted to do um, I had more of a business background. He is an engineer. He had a much greater technical background. So I thought our skill sets would line up with each other so that we could manage opening a brewery together. And we had similar kind of expectations of what we were 
uh, wanting to put in and what we were wanting to get out. So I think everything kind of came aligned with us partnering, and then we just looked at how hard it was actually going to be to get into. Uh, once we got over those hurdles and we looked at what was needed, we just went ahead with it. And like we started in December of 2014, and we opened in April of 2016. So it it wasn't quick, but it wasn't it wasn't like we were like waiting for the right time. We just started, and that's how long it took to actually get the doors open. That's kind of like a standard about 18 months from when you decide to when you're finally going to get the door open on the place. Yeah, I think that the probably the biggest, biggest exception to that that I've seen uh, locally is Farmley. Farmley was very quick. And the reason they were so quick is because of all of the experience they had. That was a bunch of people coming together uh, from a bunch of different breweries to open a brewery. So it wasn't like two guys trying to figure out how to open a brewery. Yeah. They had already done it and they just needed to do it again. But that's pretty much the only exception I've seen to like go faster. Okay. Why a five barrel system? Um, so when we first decided to do this, we uh, we toured around to other breweries of similar sizes that existed at the time. Uh, Orange Snail was one, Five Paddles was one. And basically what everybody said is buy the biggest system that you can afford. Um, it's the same amount of work to make three barrels of beer as it is to make 30 barrels of beer. The time doesn't change. What changes is the amount of beer you have at the end of the day. So we were originally planning a three barrel system. We looked at how much it was going to be to get a five barrel system instead of three barrel system. It wasn't really that much more money. And then to jump up to seven was more. And then to jump up to 10 is significantly more because then you're probably getting into steam rather than just electric. Uh, so we just kind of decided on five, um, very glad we ordered a five barrel system and a three barrel system. We're still brewing on our original brew house. We've since added 10 barrel fermenters and a 10 barrel bright. So we can double batch if we need to, but, uh, three would have just been too small from the beginning and five as a, as a two person brewery, a five barrel system is a nice size. Yeah. Now, when you first opened, you guys sold out really quickly, didn't you? Um, I think that there's, I mean, we, we've always done well. Like we've always not really had an issue moving product. I think that things didn't really, I think there's a misconception that we sell out of beer super quickly. And that isn't necessarily the case. Like some beers sell out super quickly and some beers stick around forever. So when we first opened, we were doing this part-time, well, I shouldn't say part-time. We were doing it full-time on the side of doing other full-time jobs. So we were, we were only able to produce a certain amount of beer and that beer, sometimes it went in a weekend, sometimes it was around for a month. But relative to other breweries, it always seemed to disappear pretty quickly. And it's always what you sell out of that, that's what everybody wants. So whatever you sell out of, the next three people that walk in the door are going to be disappointed because that's the beer that they came for. So I don't think that we sell out of beer really any faster than anybody else our size. But there's definitely that general perception out there that we sell out of beer so quickly. That's probably a good thing because it makes people come in quicker to get beer. Yeah, I mean, the busiest that we ever are in a week, uh, right now we're open on Fridays 12 to 6, we're on open Saturdays 12 to 4, and 12 to 1 on Fridays, busiest hour of the week. And it's still based on people thinking they need to get there super early to get the beer that we released that week. And that's great. Um, I'm glad that people do that. It guarantees you that you will definitely get what you paid for. Um, but like we released the beer that people were super excited about two weeks ago. We still have some going into next weekend, which is the third weekend. So most of the time you will have a couple weekends to get whatever it is that we release. Do you just release one beer a week? Um, the schedule that we typically operate on on a week-to-week -week basis is one beer a week. Um, we're usually only making one beer a week. But sometimes the beer we make that week doesn't come out on a normal turnaround, which for us is normally, it would come out two weeks after we brewed it. So if we're brewing something that takes longer, then we have to either slot in a beer that we had previously brewed that has taken longer into that release, or we miss a week and then we double up on a week and release two beers in a week. And now that we're into the time of year that we are getting into like barrel aged imperial stouts, barley wines, stuff like that, We'll typically release those alongside a regular turnaround beer. So those weeks we'll see two releases 
rather than just like what would have normally come out in a normal third. So that just popped a couple questions in my head. Sure. So the first one's going to be so when you're when you're doing the barrel aging stuff, that kind of complicates your brewing a little bit more, doesn't it? It does. So typically when we brew the beer that's going to go into barrels, we brew that uh, as a second batch of a week. So 15 months ago, we, will have, we would have brewed twice in one week. Uh, one for a quick turnaround beer, the other one for something that's going to go into barrels. So then we barrel age it. All our barrel aging is typically a minimum of a year. And we've gone as long as two years for stouts and barley wines. We've gone even longer for sours. So once we decide that that particular barrel is ready, then we just try to find the time to slot that into package it. So then that, so 15 months ago, we brewed twice in a week. And then this week we'll package twice in a week and that will create two releases of that same week. So it does throw a wrench in it, but we typically have one day a week where we can either brew for a second time, we can package for a second time, or we can use that for deliveries or events or whatever. So we usually have a one day buffer where we can do one extra thing a week, depending on what we need to do that week. Um, but we couldn't do that every, we couldn't, we don't have the time to brew twice a week every week or package twice a week every week. Okay. So you're doing all the packaging in-house? Yep. Yep. So when we, so when, Pre-pandemic, we were growlers and draft for 90% of what we produced. We still bottled at that point uh, ourselves in-house. Um, that was typically imperial stouts or sours. Um, and then we had maybe like three or four times brought in a mobile canner to can specialty one-off things. But it was a novelty to have one of our, especially our hoppy beer, it was a novelty to have it in package. Um, once the pandemic hit and we didn't have a tap room anymore and draft sales completely disappeared, we had to start packaging. So we had the capability of packaging in bottles, which we did do right off the hop. And then very quickly we got in with Northern Canning to come in and can all of our like quick turnaround normal beer, with all of our hobby beer, all of our lager, stuff like that. Um, so we went from never having beer in cans to only ever having beer in cans. It's starting from like April of 2020. That's a substantial change, isn't it? It was, it was, it was like, it was everything we had done up until that point. You could throw it out the window because we had literally no idea what the demand was going to be. It was, it was, you were still doing the same thing in terms of brewing. You were still producing the same beer, but in terms of what the response was going to be, it was, it was a brand new world. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was, a complete change. It, it was a, it was two different phases of the same business. Wow. So you get Northern Canning in every week then? So we did. Uh, so we were bringing in Northern Canning once a month, actually. And what we would do is we would produce as much beer. We would fill every single tank we possibly could and have as much beer ready for them as we could. So we, would, we started with the first time they came in, they did 10 barrels. And then we got up as high as them doing 25 barrels each time they came in. Um, but we also quickly realized because they were getting busier that we needed to have our own way of packaging cans. So we bought our own canning room. We bought it, uh, bought a Gosling, um, which is just a single head canning system from Wild Goose. So we, I mean, I can't remember when it was, but it was very early pandemic. We, we purchased that. It took probably six months for it to arrive. And then once we got it, we started canning in November of 2020 ourselves, and we've been canning ourselves ever since. Wow. Okay. So that was just a complete another mental shift. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, everything that comes along with packaging too is like, like now we have to have pallets of cans around. We have to, every beer has to have a name and a label before we commit to making it or packaging it. Whereas before in the, in the growler days, Sometimes we were naming beers 15 minutes before we opened because it didn't really matter what the beer was called. We were we had to start selling it. So sometimes it was just mosaic and enigma IPA. Um, didn't have a label, so we could just write on the growler tag whatever we decided to call that week's beer. Yeah. So that must constrict the amount. I mean, you're in 2,400 square feet. So having to store air because you're storing empty cans, that must take up a lot of space. Yeah, yeah. So we're completely, we have been now for a while. Like the reason, one of the biggest reasons why our tap room hasn't ever reopened 
since we closed it in April of 2020 is because we completely filled the space with all of the stuff that you need to package product. Um, and we made headway to try to clear that stuff out and try to make room to be able to reopen the tap room. But every time you make progress on something like that, something else happens and you need to fill the space back up. So the tap room was never a big, like it wasn't ever like a big way for us to create revenue. It was always full. We were still only open back in those days, nine hours a week. So it was full for those nine hours, but it was never the bread and butter of the business. It was kind of just like a bonus. And thankfully, not having it hasn't really hurt us. We're still selling all of the beer that we make. So now it's just in packages going out the door, in package, like bottles or cans going out the door, rather than people sitting here and having glasses of beer or taking growl or something. I'm going to ask you about how you, with everything that's going on, how you unwind, but let's talk about the second beer. Okay. Uh, so the second beer we have, I'm just going to grab a bottle of it. So Saison. Saison. Uh, this is the second time we've done this beer. Um, it is a Saison. This one was brewed with spooky Saison yeast from Escarpment Labs as the primary, like in primary. Uh, it was done in a single wall, flat bottom wine fermenter. So no temperature control whatsoever. We brewed it in the peak of summer. So it was like over a hundred degrees in the brewery. We let it go at that temperature we let it free rise we open fermented it so there was no lid on the fermenter and then once it was done primary fermentation we capped it uh, let it chill out in the fermenter for a few months i think it was like two three months and then we bottle conditioned it with uh breath bacteria that we had borrowed from a brewery in quebec uh that is very well known for this particular style of beer um so it's a really cool beer. It's something, this beer is very much what I was doing as a home brewer. It's, it's very much how I approached brewing when I was just brewing for fun. Um, and it's cool that we still get to make beer like that. We don't do it very often. Um, the interest in it is definitely not as high as it is for poppy beer, but uh, we still fit it in when we can. And the nice thing is when we do it, it's around for a really long time. So anyone who's into it can enjoy it over the course of several months without worrying about whether it's there the next time. It's got a fantastic aroma, Matt. Yep. Wow. Yep. This is the, this is like the type of beer that I really enjoy brewing, the type of beer I really enjoy drinking. Um, like I said, it, there's not a lot of interest. One of the biggest misconceptions I had was I thought that what me and my friends liked drinking was what everybody liked drinking. And we would sit around and we would seek out beers like this from all over the world, from Belgium, from the States, from all of the different producers that were making well-respected versions of this style. So I just thought that the general uh, appetite for beers like this was considerably higher than it was. And this is one of those things that people that like this and drink this and know this style see a ton of value in producing a beer like this. But the general public is like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> general public says on what's that yeah and it's not even that it's like like that style all all beer styles have become less and less have less meaning now than they ever have like the range within that style is, is massive but so the general public maybe they have had a saison but maybe it's a saison that's just a, like a straight sack fermented saison that's in a can from the lcbo for three dollars a can and that would be a fine beer to drink. And it's a nice, again, it's a nice food beer. It's an okay beer, but that is not what this is. Like this is a significantly different beer than that. So sometimes calling something, something as simple as Saison, people know what they're getting into. And other times they have no idea what they're getting into. It all depends on what, how much they know about how broad that style can be. So what do you describe that front tone as? The front? Yeah. Front. Um, I say, I'd say that the, the first thing you get on this is you get fruitiness from both the primary ferment with the Saison yeast, um, and then a little bit of like Brett bump. And then as you as it progresses across the palate, you definitely get into, it has a little bit of tartness, like 
some people like it is a sour beer like there is sourness yeah. to it but i would say it's as sour as like a, a beer that we would sell as a sour so it does have the tartness and then the nice thing about this is it, it it's the beer is bone dry like it finished that one yeah. even in terms of gravity but it drinks very full like it has it's bottle finished so it has a nice uh full mouth feel and uh it kind of like explodes in your mouth and across your palate but it's it, the beer itself is bone dry so i get tangerine peach coconut and then the funk yeah and yeah. it's just it just you're right it just explodes like you, the tangerine yeah. and then oh my gosh the peach and then the coconut and then you get the funk and it's like wow yeah yeah it's a really cool like i said it's a really cool beer it's something that like if you've drank a lot of beers like this you're you're completely into um but if you're trying to explain to somebody who just found you on google maps what this beer is if they have no experience with it the best thing to do is just say like just take it home drink it let me know what you think of it the next time you're in yep that's exactly the simplest way to do it it is i'm not a normally a saison drinker yeah but i could sit here and drink this one yeah all night long yeah 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 kind of like that's again going back to the way that i i like drinking beer i like making beers that you can have multiple of that you want to go back to yep. Um, and the trend, especially now, or it may be, I think we're kind of getting past it, but the trend for the last several years was all about intensity in beer. Like people wanted to have the most amount of flavor that they could possibly have crammed into the beer that they were drinking. And some of those beers were not very drinkable. You couldn't, you're like, this is the best beer in the world, but I can't even finish a 500 bottle of it by myself. And that is not what I like about beer. I like having beer that you can drink in quantity and you're it's engaging and you're always finding new things about it to enjoy um but at the end of the day it's a drinkable beverage yeah yeah so we'll go back to the question i asked just before we switch to this one yeah. with every everything that's gone on through covid and the last two years how do you unplug how do you step away from everything um i four kids. Uh, I have a big family. Uh, I, I very much try to separate my working life from my family life. So I like to get into the brewery early. I like to uh, get the work done for the day. And then I like to go home and I like to spend time with them. So that's, that's really what I do is I try to devote as much time as I can carve out of my day uh, to have that family life and then have my brewery like to have the brewery there as my day-to-day -day go to work that's what you're doing to make an income so unwind i just try to find things at home uh that i like doing like i like i love like all i have three boys that are all very much into sports so i like playing sports with them um i have my daughter is uh super into academics so i like helping her out with her interests and uh helping her out uh getting her to all the different academic things that she needs to get to so just finding ways to integrate into each one of their lives is the way that i unwind from the brewery life. so with the multitude of beers that you make because you're doing at least one new beer every week yeah and then there's the multiple weeks where you do two beers because you're doing the barrel aging. Yep. What's the process for you to decide what you're making? Uh, so generally for beers that we have available, we like to keep uh, multiple different hobby beers. Hobby beers are the main things that we sell. We sell more hobby beer than anything. So we like to have something like a pale ale strength, IPA, double IPA or triple IPA around. So we won't have all four of those, but we like to have a variety of those around. So we're, we're basically trying to decide how much of what we have, when it's going to sell out, when do we need to replace the IPA? When do we need to replace the double IPA? When do we need to replace pale ale? And then also trying to fit in the secondary styles. So in the summer we do loggers. Like, so we, we, every summer we release multiple loggers. This one, the last one that we released this summer was the Pilsner that we started out with. Um, as we transition into fall and winter, 
we do stouts and porters kind of as like the secondary style. So tomorrow we're brewing our first porter of the fall. Um, so that'll be like that kind of transition. And we had to figure out, like we have it on the schedule, but then we have to figure out the week where it can slot in and not mess everything else up. And then those beers sell slower, but it allows you to have variety. So fitting one of those in is important. Uh, and then it's there for a couple months, but it is a change of pace because every week people show up they're like, I don't like hoppy beer. And we're like, oh, okay. Well, that's mostly what we do, but we do have these other couple things. So you have, it's very important to have that sort of variety uh, in your offerings. Um, so yeah, deciding what we do is based on mostly on need. Like we will never run out of the things that people come here to buy, but then also figuring out when we have time to slot in the things that we want to make and that other people uh, want as well. And you also do collabs once in a while. We do do collabs. Um, we definitely aren't as heavy on collabs as other breweries are. Again, the biggest reason is because we are only a two-person brewery. So if we are going to dedicate a day to go to somebody else's brewery to brew a collab, we got no other work done that day. So that's super tough. Um, when people come to us to brew collabs, that's great. We're the beers in-house we're brewing it on our system, we're packaging, we're selling it ourselves. So finding time to do collabs, especially collabs where we're brewing uh, at a different brewery um, is challenging. Uh, but that's where I said earlier, when we have that one day a week, uh, that's kind of like a buffer day, like we can fit in a second brew day, we can fit in a package day. If we're brewing it in a, an away game collab, that's always on that day. And that's typically Thursday every week. Okay. What's your typical day look like? Um, I wouldn't say we have a typical day. We have a we have a very standard week. So Monday, we transfer a beer to the bright tank. We clean the fermenter the beer or the that beer came out of. We prep for brew day. Uh, Tuesday is always brew day. Every week we're always brewing on Tuesdays. Uh, Wednesday is usually packaging like. 95% of the time Wednesday's packaging and then Thursday is the wild card day. So like typically we're here Monday through Thursday, kind of nine to three, but what we're doing on each day is not the same thing Monday through Thursday. Um, and then we do retail Friday, Saturday. So I say we have a very typical week, but not a very typical day. Okay. And do you guys alternate who runs the retail? Uh, so we, back in the taproom days, um, and the growler days, we, we both worked retail for all of the retail shifts. Um, the only exception to that would be if we had deliveries to do, um, we would, I would typically deliver on Fridays and Jeremy would typically deliver on Saturdays if we had out of town deliveries to do. Um, but I, most of the time, 90% plus of the time we were both here. Um, since we've transitioned to be mostly a package uh, and not running the top or not, so we still do fill growlers, but a significantly lower percentage of our beer goes into growlers. Um, we're usually just one person in for, for the retail days. Um, so we don't necessarily have a set day that one of us will be here, the other one will do the other day. We just kind of discuss between the two of us what works better for us, for us that week. And some weekends, I'll do the whole weekend and then take the next weekend off and he'll do the whole weekend. So, yeah. And doing deliveries, you're doing home deliveries or do you guys have a, a, a bunch of uh, bar accounts So we do bottle shops? We don't do home deliveries and we've never done online sales. So the only way to buy our beer to take home is typically through, like from our retail store. Um, but we do have a bunch of licensed accounts that take both package product and uh, keg product. So we have in KW, there's a handful um hamilton is big there's hamilton is probably the city that has got the most of our beer i uh, deliver to it and then toronto we maybe do quarterly um slightly more frequently than that maybe but that's basically it. it's either hamilton toronto or just in kw why hamilton i don't really know how it worked out that way i think initially it was the the, the licensees that were there reached out to us and there was enough of them that it made sense to make that a dedicated 
delivery. Um, so then we kind of established ourselves in that city, and now we have four that we deliver every single time we go to Hamilton. We know we're going to have four deliveries, and sometimes it's five, sometimes it's six, and then we have one place that comes from Hamilton and picks up from us. If we're not going to Hamilton, they come pick up from us every week. So it's just been a city that's always supporting us. And I guess we have more of a footprint in that city than we do so in any other kind of big market. And it helps that it's, I mean, it's half an hour from yeah. here to there. So it's, it's, it's a big market that's very close. Uh, that's, that, that, first of all, Hamilton's one of my favorite cities. So yeah. um, are, they do, are they doing mostly, mostly packaged or are they doing some kegs? Uh, mostly, so pre-pandemic it was all kegs. Uh, now that we package, there's a lot of places that are taking package uh, and then they serve in-house or they have takeaway. Now that bars are allowed to do takeaway, like uh, a lot of licensees are operating as bottle shops, essentially. So that's been a big thing. And Hamilton kind of has a good mix of both. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely a mix. Um, most licensees, especially like restaurants, definitely prefer kegs. But if we don't have something that they want in keg, then most are pretty willing to take back. Okay. And have you seen any significant increase in the number of um, domestic, like people coming in and asking for kegs for their uh, kegerators? Uh, we've never really, like, we've had people ask us right when we open if we can do that. It's not something that we've really ever done. Um, usually the people that get kegs, uh, from us for their home keg regulators or people that we know really well or people that are having like a party and they're like i really want your beer at a party but it's not the like, kegs for home is not something that we've ever really focused on doing it's not something we do a lot of. like we might do one of them okay so at the beginning of the pandemic you make this switch to packaged goods who started doing your your labels for you uh so we've always had the same designer his name is brian uh, it's a guy that Jeremy worked with. Uh, they both worked at the same company previously, like previous to us starting Barncat. Uh, so he's always been our designer. He's always he's designed every label that we've ever used. Um, his workload was significantly less when we were just growlers and glasses a year because we were only releasing maybe like 10 products a year in package, whereas like now we're releasing one a week. Um, yeah. So any beer that comes out, any new product that comes out that has a label, he designed the label. Uh, he works with Jeremy uh, on, like Jeremy will tell him the beer, the style, kind of maybe like a theme for the label. He'll come up with it, they'll go back and forth, and then we'll send it off to, to have the label printed and then get it on those cans. How do you decide on a name? I mean, that's, naming beers is probably one of the hardest things about running a brewery, especially when uh our the expectation is that we're releasing a new beer every single week so a lot of times we're not releasing a new beer it might be an ipa we released a year ago but it's a new batch of that idea yeah. um so naming beers is is very very difficult coming like coming up with names especially names that haven't been used names that are they mean something to someone for whatever reason it's it's very hard coming up with names is, is super super hard most of them now, a lot of them are brands that were established in the growler days and then will use that sort of, like however we, like, so like everything that we do with Citra has some sort of juice variant to it. So like our pale ale with Citra is the juice and then the double IPA is double the juice, the triple IPA is triple the juice. Um, our galaxy beers are always something in space. So cats in space kittens in space it all depends on what the strength of the beer is and then like kind of what we decided to name that variant of that particular style of beer that must be fun and terrifying at the same time no i mean it's definitely not the most fun thing it's fun when there's something that has a name and has a label and then you can sell it. yeah that's when it becomes fun yeah that's what i mean like it's terrifying because oh my gosh we got to come up with a name but then when it when it finally sticks, yeah, it's you're like, like okay, good. got that one in the bag now. Yeah, like cats in space. That's got to be so you know. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, like yeah. So cats in space comes up, and then you 
you're like, okay, we're brewing that one. We already have a name. We already have a label for it. But then you also start to find, like I said, like uh, variations of that beer that you can do so that you don't have to come up with a new name or you can just tweak something that you've already come up with. Yeah. So which beer are we going to talk about next? Uh, I mean, you should do the IPA next. Probably. Okay. I had the privilege of trying that on tap uh, on the weekend at Reverend's. Yeah. It, uh, people were really enjoying it. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the beer is called Dream Team. Um, it's made in our very, in like a very similar style to all of our IPAs. We, we typically go 6.8% on IPAs. This one is Rawaka and Nelson. Uh, for the hops, which are our two favorite hops. Um, we had never used them both in the same beer before. Um, for Waka especially, is very, very hard to get nowadays. Um, so we don't get a lot of it. We can't use it all that often. So usually when we do get it, we're using it exclusively in that beer. Um, but yeah, pairing it with Nelson, uh, we were super happy with the results. Yeah. If, if I hadn't been able to read what was up on the board about what the beer was, I would have been mystified because I got the Nelson in the nose right away. But yeah. then it was like, what is that other hop in there? Yeah. Rewaka, Rewaka is very, very unique. Um, Nelson is very unique too. The thing that we really like about them is that they both are so much different than a lot of the hops that are typically used in IPAs. Um, yeah, it's it's a really cool beer. We're we're super pumped about it. It's not going to be something that we can make a lot of because getting Rewaka is so hard. Um, but yeah, we're we're super happy with the way that that beer turned out. And I imagine Rewaka is not inexpensive either right now. It's Rewaka. The Rewaka that we're getting right now is twice as much as Nelson, which is more than any other hop that we buy. So yeah, it's it's expensive. Um, the all Rewaka double IPA that we recently did, we had to sell for triple IPA pricing because of how expensive the hops are. Um, and that's one thing that like we, we never approached beer making, like how can we make this cost effective or like, are we making the right financial decision? We're just like, how can we make the best beer? So when we find something like these hops that we really like and they're expensive, we're just like, well, it's going to make it. We have to price it accordingly. And We'll let people decide if that works for them. And thankfully, up until this point, it has. So it's not like we're sitting there trying to like nickel and dime a recipe to figure out how to make it cheaper. We're just trying to make the best beer that we can ever then we make you. Well, you answered my question that I was about to ask, which is how are you handling all of the price increases that everyone in the industry has been facing for the last 12 months? Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Um, we haven't, for the most part, increased our prices at all. Um, we are just buying the stuff that we like to buy. We were always kind of at the top of the price, like of the price points that you saw in the Ontario market. We were always kind of close to the top anyway. Um, so we're finding ways to make it work. Um, the transition from being, like selling all, basically all our product out the front door helps a lot. Like we're not having to do sell kegs to bars who then have to mark up the beer. We're keeping all of that in house. So as much as we can. So that's a big way of, of helping it rise the cost too. Okay. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. You say that you don't do any online sales. We do not, no. Is that is that a conscious decision on the part of the brewery? Um the, the biggest thing is we've always been able to sell all of our beer without doing it. So adding another uh, amount, like no matter what, adding that to our workload is going to be more work. So if it became a requirement, like that's what we needed to do to be able to sell the beer that we make, then we would hundred percent do it. We have a website design. We've talked about it numerous times throughout the course of the years that this is the next step that we could do to potentially sell more beer. We've just never got to the point where it became a requirement of needing to sell the beer that way. The other thing that I think is pretty important to our brewery is we have, especially Fridays, the, people, the, the first 25 people through the door are the same 25 people every week. So if we start selling beer online, 
and now now those guys aren't getting the, our stuff like they've come to expect every week. That's not the best thing for them. So we haven't had to do it, which is the only reason we haven't. If as soon as we need to, we will start doing. So then that raises the, the, the mind. You you actually have a barn cat community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, it was it was it was even more so in the top room days. Like on again, especially on Fridays, the top room was full of the same people every single week. And that's the thing that we both missed the most about the top room is seeing the same people every single week uh, for those top room hours. Um, but the vast majority of them still come in by our beer and hang out and hang, like talk with us every week. It's just now they're buying cans and bottles to go rather than drinking in the tap room. So there's definitely, definitely people that are here every week. And then there's some people that are here once a month, but it's very rare, especially on a Friday to like see somebody that I've never seen before. Um, on Saturday, it's completely different Saturday. Here at our brewery, it feels like it's all beer tourism. It's people, I'm going to six breweries today, and you're one of the six breweries that I'm going to. I found you on Untapped. I found you on Google Maps. I found you however I found you. Um, but Fridays is definitely more like these are the people that come every week, and they're buying their beer for the weekend here. How did you build that community? Uh, I, I don't. We didn't do it consciously. Like it was more so like. We just started selling the, the product that we were selling. Uh, people that enjoyed it gravitated towards it. And uh, we tried to produce a very consistent uh, quality of product. So people came to trust us. They're like, we haven't had this particular beer before, but we trust that every other beer that we've had before has been the same quality. So we're just going to buy this one too. And then they just get used to coming back here. Um, I think, yeah, I think mostly it's just about being consistent. We very rarely changed the hours that were open. Um, it's always been everybody that's ever walked in here has been served by me or Jeremy. It's always the same people. It's always the same hours. And the product is always the same quality. And I think that's really all we did to, to kind of build what we have. Okay. I, I'm just curious. So consistency is what I hear in your, in your dialogue here. Yeah. Consistency of quality, the consistency of your hours and, the people come in the door, they know they're going to see you or Jeremy. Yeah. 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 Okay. It must be nice for you and Jeremy to, to realize that that community has that much sort of trust and faith in you. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It, that is really nice. And it's always, like I said, you still, you, you see people come and go from within there. Like people move, people find other breweries, but there, and there's always people coming in, but like, for the six years that we've been doing this, the people that I spend my most the most time with outside of being at work are people that I nowadays are people that I met because of this brewery. So it really does become your extended family, uh, just because those are the people that you're seeing all the time, and those are the people that you're you're hanging out with anyway. So it is it has been a really cool part of this journey is building that sort of community around this particular place. Yeah, that sense of community. Yeah. Let's talk about the last beer. Okay. Uh, so the last beer is Mother Night. Uh, barrel aged Imperial Stout, uh, aged in bourbon barrels. Um, for this particular Imperial Stout, we add maple syrup. Uh, towards the end of fermentation. So there's a secondary fermentation uh, with maple syrup prior to barrel aging. And then this particular bottling of this beer was barrel aged for 15 months uh, in bourbon barrels. I think it's 13%. It's a big, strong, bourbony black beer. Yeah, you get that bang right just as soon as you put your nose in the glass. Uh, I'd say that this style of beer is probably the second biggest draw that we have. Like, hoppy beer is definitely what we sell the most of. But this, especially this time of year, people start asking for beers like this. And now that we've been brewing as long as we have, we have a steady supply of it. Like, 
when you first put Imperial Stout into barrels and you know you're not going to see it again for 12 months, you don't know what the demand is going to be. So then if it sells out in a day, you're like, okay, well, 12 months from now we'll have more. Whereas now that we've been doing it as long as we have, we will always have a steady supply of beer like this because we can start 12, 15 months ago making it so that we have enough of it when the time comes around that it's ready. So we typically have something like this throughout, definitely through when we start releasing it in the fall through to uh, like Christmas time. And then we do usually one more or two more releases, January, February, kind of ride out the winter. Do you store the barrels offsite? No, oh, in here. Wow. That's why we have wow. no room. I got to yeah. say, you'd be climbing all over everything now. No, yeah, no, that's exactly what we do. Um, we we have a large footprint dedicated to our barrel aging area, and we we have all the barrels in house. Um, like we don't, like we do everything in house. We we do all our barrel sorts in house, all our packaging in house. We do as much stuff as we can with just the two of us and i think that has a big impact on why the beers are the way they are i'm, I'm sure it does see if i'd known you were going to be at the brewery because i wasn't thinking i would have came down we could have just been sitting side by side there you go yeah except so, that i uh, i think we i would have had to have been sitting on a barrel probably so that you know. yeah we could have carved out there is a little bit of room we could have been sitting on pallets of bottles too there's you can always find <laughs> Next time I'll be, I'll, I'll, be, I'll come down to the brewery. Oh, It'll be, yeah. So that, how many, do you mind sharing with us? How many barrels would you have at any time? Uh, so, so like right now we probably have about 30 total barrels. Um, it's actually, that number has probably shrunk a little bit because we've started to get into packaging. We've already packaged, um, three beers that we will release like that was the mother and you're drinking now is the first one to release in the season we have two other ones already uh bottled so they're waiting on labels or they're waiting until they're ready to be released we have more coming we have one more in the tank right now that we're going to package as soon as that's out that frees up the tank you get another one in there and we'll just have a steady stream um so i'd say like at the peak of production we'll have about 30 and then that will dwindle down till to the end of kind of packaging season then come in the new year we'll build that back up wow and yeah. you've got to you've got to keep that all i'm sure you physically organize it but you've also got to kind of keep that all in your head where what yeah. what barrels what and when you're going to be pulling that out because yeah. those will all be stacked right yeah so yeah so typically what we'll do is we'll brew a batch um and then yeah if you're burying if you're burying a set of barrels below another one, the top stuff on the top has to come up first. So like you could say, this is going to be two year barrel age because we're putting fresher stuff on top of it. So yeah, you have to be conscious of how you're organizing your inventory and have a, have an idea of when it's going to come out. And the nice thing about beers like this is it's forgiving. Like it doesn't have to be 15 months. It could be 12 and it could be 18, but you have to be aware of what you have where so that you can get to whatever you need to get to when you need it. Do you taste the barrels on a regular basis? Um, not, I mean, basically we decide what we're going to release in a time frame, and then we'll, so like we have a release coming up, uh, Rat Queen is our, is our main Imperial set, like that's the Imperial set we're best known for. So we have a couple variants of that that are going to be released uh, coming up this year. So we have multiple barrels and we'll be like, this is the barrel that's going to be released as a straight up, this is just barrel aged beer. This is the barrel that we're selecting to add these particular adjuncts to. So we taste through them and make a plan for each of the barrels that we have for that packaging season. But we're not sampling it every month like, oh, this is coming along nicely. We, we know at this point kind of where we want them, what type, type of age we want them to be at before we release them. So I'd say starting at like maybe a year, we'll taste them to make sure that everything's progressing the way we want to. And then we'll start planning for how we're going to treat each individual barrel of beer um, moving forward. Yeah. Where it's placed in a pile, in other words, like how high off the ground, yeah. does that have an impact on how the barrel ages? Uh, not that I've seen. Like typically it's more barrel to barrel. So 
when you're getting when you're ordering bourbon barrels or rye barrels, whatever type of barrel it is from barrel suppliers, you have no idea what happened to that before it arrives at your door. So there's a lot more variation. Like you can order four barrels and put the same batch of beer into four barrels and have more variation amongst those four barrels than you would based on where the barrels are stored uh, within your brewery. So I'd say there's more barrel to barrel variation simply based on the environment within the barrel than there is anything, any other variables. Yep. And do you reuse your barrels? We have reused them. Um, we typically don't. Uh, it, it, it depends. We, we, we do a porter that we used to do barrel aged version of in secondary, second use whiskey barrels. And people, again, it was like one of those things that people just didn't get it. Like, they're like, this isn't an imperial set. We're like, we know that. It's a barrel aged porter. Like, it's not, it doesn't need 15 months. It's not supposed to be a whiskey ball. It's supposed to have barrel influence, but not be the focus of the beer. So, it is something that we have done, but it's just not, and it'll never be the primary point of our barrel production. Like, Again, with barrel aging, people want intensity. They want a big beer with big barrel presence and a lot of flavor. Yeah. Okay. So when you're when you're done, you would usually then sell it on to another brewery, a home yeah, brewer. So basically, all we do when we're done with the barrel is we we post uh, usually through Instagram, usually on a story that it's available for sale, and then either people buy them to turn them into tables, people buy them for to put on their patio. We have had other breweries buy them. Um, they always end up somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Has the cost of used barrels gone up in the last year? Uh, barrel pricing, it has gone up, just kind of happening uh, as everything else has gone up. It's more like transportation. Like barrel brokerages have to pay more to get the barrels into their space, but then they have to charge us more for the barrels, and then we have to charge more for stuff because it costs us to get like it costs us more to get them in house so it's all trans transportation is the main top reason why the cost of everything is gone well oh, absolutely yeah. <coughs> somehow the bank of canada doesn't get that the price the price of fuel is what's killing everything and in inflation not not anything else exactly. yeah. you know because every <laughs> everything in north america moves by a truck at some point and usually three or four trucks so yeah you know, and the cost of diesel almost tripled at one point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. So, yeah, so barrels are still, um, I'd say that they're more accessible now than they were at the height of demand for for uh, X whiskey barrels. Um, there was a time they were very hard to come by. That peak has passed. So they're not super hard to get. You just have to know where to get them. And then they cost what they cost, and you pass, pass the price on. Yeah. I'm going to say there was a point where everyone was doing barrel aged beers and now that's kind of a trend that's died out. I think so. Like, I think, I think that there was a, there was an infatuation with barrel aged beer across a wide spectrum of styles. And now I think that breweries and consumers have figured out the styles that actually work and make sense to barrel age and those styles still do well, but like, yeah. Like the interest in other styles being barrel aged and being barrel aged for the sake of being barrel aged is, has been lost. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, and like you say, the you you mentioned made mention earlier about the trend of like full bodied, big flavored beers. Yeah, happening, and that's you know that that reminds me of when the West Coast IPA style took off and then everybody was trying to pack as many IBUs in them as they could possibly pack. Yeah. And that went on for like a year and a half, two years. And then now we're, we're back to creating great, flavorful, well-made IPAs. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. That's, I think that, and I think the same thing in specifically in IPA is like people wanted like, so hazy IPAs weren't a thing. And then it became such a big thing that now that's basically all you see in craft beer. And then now people are trending back away from hazy IPAs, but nobody knows what's next. So like now you release a West Coast and it's more of a novelty. You're like, I can't believe you have a West Coast. We hardly see those anymore. Yeah. Whereas like when we started six years ago, that's all there was on the market was West Coast and you couldn't find a hazy IPA anywhere. And now 
all you find is haze. So people won't ask them. So I think that's a good thing about craft beer just in general is people always want to be experiencing new things or new ideas. And sometimes those ideas aren't actually new, but as long as they're new to those people, then they get excited for them. So it all depends where in the craft beer spectrum they started their journey. So if you started your craft beer journey on hazy IPAs and kettle sours, a 5% porter will be like mind blowing to you. You're like, I've never had a beer like this. Whereas if you started drinking craft beer in 2004, that's all you had. So then all these beers that are popular now would be beer. It's so true. So true. Jeremy and I had a little bit of a chat on Saturday about hazy IPAs. Yeah. Because he asked me and I said, I remember when they first came out and I said, trend, maybe a year, that's it. And that was like, yeah. what, three years ago? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> when we first started doing them, when, when we were business planning, um, that's the style that he was making at home. Um, and he was doing a fantastic job of it. And I was like, this is delicious. I'm like, I'm afraid to sell this because I don't know what the reaction is going to be. And the reaction to it was everybody wanted it. And yeah. we've literally been brewing those basically every week since 2006. Yeah. I'm sorry, 2006, not 2006. Yeah, true. And then the other thing is I would never have 15 years ago, and I was five years into my journey in craft beer yeah. at, at kickoff. Yeah. If you'd told me that craft breweries would be making pilsners and lagers to yeah. the degree that they were making them in the past two years, I would have been like, no, nope, that's never going to happen. That's not. <laughs> yeah. So it's always craft, craft, craft brewing has always been a trend against the grain, right? Yeah. So when craft beer became what it did, the against the grain thing to, for craft breweries to do is to start brewing pilsners and lagers again. Because that's what nobody was doing. And then that will become a trend. It will become prevalent. And then the next thing will come up. Like what's now, what is nobody doing? And then that will grow. So you always have to be working. I mean, as a business, you have to be making what people want to buy. But you're always looking for that next, the start of that next trend that's going to trend against what everybody's doing. And then that will become the next best thing or next big thing. Yeah. So I take it that uh, sparkling water is not something on your radar? What's that? Uh, sparkling flavored hot water is not on your. Uh... No, um, not really. It's uh, I like making beer. I don't really like. Uh, I, I I appreciate any beverage that anybody makes that uh, sells well for them. I would never discourage anybody from making a product that they can make it taste good and they can sell. But a brewery at our size, we basically just need to make the beer that we want to make. So, yeah. or the product we want to make. So, yeah, that's not big on our list of things to do. Okay. Is there any last thing you want to talk to us about? Uh, not necessarily. Um, no, not really. Like, I, I think one nice thing about our brewery, as I mentioned earlier, is like if you're interacting with either one of us, uh, you're getting to speak directly to like the owner of the brewery, the person making the beer, like we'll, we're fully engaged across the whole spectrum of what goes into everything that we make. And we both have a very good idea of how to answer kind of like who we are and why we're doing what we do. So like, I think that's a pretty unique opportunity um, being as small as we are. Uh, so yeah, like I think, I think that that's kind of like what sets us apart in this ever increasing amount of craft breweries is that when you come visit us you're engaging directly with there's no behind the scenes like we are the scenes we are the two people doing it gonna say you walk in the door and you are already behind the scenes on that yeah yes. that is that's it that's that's yeah. you're there yeah because yeah. i know when i stopped in to talk to jeremy a couple weeks ago about being on the show yeah I, I was like i'm in the brewery like literally i am in the brewery yeah and i was a big Again, like going back to the tap days, that was a big thing that we wanted you to feel like we didn't want you to feel like you were going into a space that was a dedicated tap room or a dedicated uh, like restaurant or anything like that. Like we wanted you to feel like you were drinking in our brewery, um, and that's awesome because like that is what you get when you are here. Um, the downside to that is we can't operate our brewery while there's people in here because you're literally in the brewery. So. Uh, Again, in the taproom days, that was more of a challenge. Not as much anymore. 
but yeah, you walk in and you're right in it. Like you're right beside everything that we do. Yeah. Matt, thank you for taking time. Yeah, no problem. Out of your busy schedule and sharing your story with us. Totally appreciate it. Yeah.